She is loved or feared, adored or disliked, Maya Angelou wrote in 1970. But few who have heard her music or glimpsed her soul react with moderation. She never got the attention her main musical influence, Billie Holiday, received. Nor did she enjoy the accolades garnered by many of those calling her an influence in their music. Artists such as Aretha Franklin, who re-recorded one of her civil rights anthems, to be young, gifted and black, thus cementing a musical bond between the Queen of Soul and the High Priestess of Soul. Then there was Mary J. Blige, who told Rolling Stone that I heard her sing a song in French I didn't even know what she was saying, and I started crying. A artists such as John Legend, who paid tribute to her during a performance at the 2015 Sundance Film Festival. There was Patti LaBelle, who credited Simone with making her more assertive in her career. How did this small-town preacher's daughter become a powerful voice for the silent? How did this underappreciated and often misunderstood woman influence so many legendary musicians? How did someone who missed her calling as a classical pianist earn the number 29 ranking on Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Singers in Music History? Nina Simone, born Eunice Kathleen Wayman, was a multi-talented American singer, songwriter, pianist, composer, arranger, and civil rights activist. Her diverse musical repertoire encompassed classical, folk, gospel, blues, jazz, R&B, and pop genres. Simone was born on February 21, 1933, in Tryon, North Carolina. Her father, John Devine Wayman, worked as a barber as well as an entertainer, and her mother, Mary Kate Irvin, was a Methodist preacher. The sixth of eight children in a poor family, she began playing piano at the age of three. The first song she learned was, God be with you till we meet again. Demonstrating a talent with the piano, she performed at her local church. Her concert debut, a classical recital, was given when she was 12. Simone later said that during this performance, her parents, who had taken seats in the front row, were forced to move to the back of the hall to make way for a white couple. She said that she refused to play until her parents were moved back to the front and that the incident contributed to her later involvement in the civil rights movement. On born into a large, impoverished family, Simone dreamed of becoming a concert pianist. She soon began formal training, her lessons paid for by benefactors who saw her promise as a pianist. She learned classical repertory and specialized in playing the works of Johann Sebastian Bach. Funds donated by a pair of patrons in Tryon allowed Simone to attend the Allen High School for Girls, a private, integrated high school in Asheville, North Carolina. In 1950, Simone graduated from Allen as the valedictorian. She earned a scholarship for a one-year program at the Juilliard School in New York City and sought a scholarship at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, where racism denied her admission. Despite this setback, she took private piano lessons with Vladimir Sokolov, a professor at Curtis. In order to fund her private lessons, Simone began playing piano at an Atlantic City nightclub under the alias Nina Simone, concealing her identity from her family while playing what was considered devil's music. Her career as a jazz vocalist began when she was asked to sing while playing at the club. Word spread about this new pianist and singer who was dipping into the songbooks of Gershwin, Cole Porter, Richard Rogers and the like, transforming popular tunes of the day into a unique synthesis of jazz, blues and classical music. Her rich, deep velvet vocal tones, combined with her mastery of the keyboard, soon attracted club goers up and down the East Coast. In 1958, she married Don Ross, a beatnik who worked as a fairground barker, but quickly regretted their marriage. Playing in small clubs in the same year, she recorded George Gershwin's I Loves You Porgy, 
which she learned from a Billie Holiday album. It became her only Billboard Top 20 success in the United States, and her debut album, Little Girl Blue, followed in February 1959. Because she had sold her rights outright for $3,000, Simone lost more than one million in royalties and never benefited financially from the album's sales. Following the success of Little Girl Blue, Nina Simone signed with Colpix Records, securing artistic freedom in selecting her material in exchange for the contract. Her live album, Nina Simone at Town Hall, further elevated her popularity, making her a favored performer in Greenwich Village. Despite performing pop music for financial support to continue her classical studies, Simone remained indifferent towards having a recording contract and maintained this stance throughout most of her career. In the early 1960s, Simone often performed in New York City's Greenwich Village, where she mixed with artists and intellectuals like James Baldwin and Langston Hughes. These experiences prompted Simone to get involved with the civil rights movement. Simone performed benefit concerts for groups like the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She released the iconic protest song Mississippi Goddamn in 1964 in reaction to the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama and the assassination of civil rights leader Medgar Evers, both in 1963. Simone continued to speak out forcefully about the African-American freedom struggle and became associated with black nationalism and black power movements. In December 1961, Simone married Andrew Stroud, a New York police detective who eventually became her manager and the father of her daughter, Lisa. However, their relationship took a dark turn as Stroud subjected Simone to psychological and physical abuse in the following years. In 1967, Simone transitioned to RCA Victor. Her first RCA album, Nina Simone Sings the Blues, featured Backlash Blues by Langston Hughes. Subsequent albums like Silk and Soul included Billy Taylor's I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free and Turning Point. Her Nuff Said album contained a poignant live recording made just three days after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. She dedicated a performance to him and sang, Why, the King of Love is Dead. Simone also performed it at the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969, captured in Questlove's 2021 documentary, Summer of Soul. And Simone transformed Lorraine Hansberry's unfinished play into the civil rights anthem, to be young, gifted, and black. The song, featured on her album, Black Gold, honored Hansberry. The track was released as a single and later covered by artists like Aretha Franklin and Donny Hathaway. In an interview with Jet Magazine, Simone expressed that her controversial song, Mississippi Goddamn, negatively impacted her career. She believed the music industry penalized her through record boycotts. Feeling hurt and disillusioned, Simone departed from the United States in September 1970, heading to Barbados. She expected her husband and manager, Stroud, to arrange her future performances. However, Stroud misunderstood Simone's sudden departure and the fact that she left her wedding ring behind as a sign she wanted a divorce. And upon her return to the United States, Simone discovered an arrest warrant was issued against her for unpaid taxes, reportedly withheld in protest against the country's involvement in the Vietnam War. To avoid potential prosecution, Simone fled back to Barbados, remaining there for an extended period. At the encouragement of her friend, singer Miriam Makiba, Simone decided to relocate to Liberia. Upon relocating, Nina Simone left her daughter Lisa behind in Mount Vernon. Lisa later joined Simone in Liberia, but their reunion was troubled as Lisa recounted experiencing physical and mental abuse from her mother. The distress led Lisa to return to New York to live with her father, Andrew Stroud. 
A hiatus followed until 1978, when she was convinced by CTI Records' owner, Creed Taylor, to return to the studio, resulting in the album Baltimore. During the 1980s, she led a transient life, residing in Liberia, Barbados, Switzerland, and eventually settling in Paris. In Paris, she frequently performed at small jazz clubs, though the quality of her shows varied. At times, Simone's performances were brilliant, while on other occasions, she struggled due to intoxication or outbursts toward the audience. In the late 1980s, Nina Simone was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Known for her temper and occasional outbursts, Simone faced incidents that reflected her struggles. In 1985, she discharged a firearm at a record company executive, accusing him of stealing royalties, though she admitted she missed when attempting to harm him. Later, in 1995, while residing in France, Simone wounded her neighbor's son with an air gun. This incident occurred when she was disturbed by the boy's laughter, perceiving it as a racial insult after voicing her complaints. Subsequently, she received an eight-month suspended sentence, pending psychiatric evaluation and treatment. By spring 1988, Simone had moved to the Netherlands, buying an apartment near the Belvoir Hotel with the help of friends. The aim was to provide a calming environment for her. Despite her diagnosed bipolar disorder and occasional outbursts, Simone found some happiness in the Netherlands, leading a relatively anonymous life. In 1991, Simone left the Netherlands for Amsterdam, residing there for two years with friends and her caretaker. In 1993, Simone settled in southern France. That same year marked the release of her final album, A Single Woman. During a 1998 performance in Newark, Simone declared she wouldn't return to the United States. She battled breast cancer for years before peacefully passing away in her sleep on April 21, 2003, at her home in France. Her funeral drew notable figures like Miriam Makeba, Patti LaBelle, Osi Davis, Ruby Dee, Sonia Sanchez, and hundreds of others. Simone's ashes were scattered in Africa. Two days before her death, Simone learned she would be awarded an honorary degree by the Curtis Institute of Music, the music school that had refused to admit her as a student at the beginning of her career. This is Alexander from One Track Jazz. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel.